uh, our, our last session before uh, the lunch break. Uh, wanted to dig in a little bit more into tomorrow and what that looks like. Um, we have a lovely fireside chat on VR uh, and the other new digital monetization strategies. Uh, we have Ad Age's Jeremy Barr and Kevin Gensel, Chief Revenue Officer at Gannett. Come on up, guys. Nice to see you. How are you? Much time, so I'll get sort of right into it. Um, so we've talked before a lot about Gannett and what Gannett's doing, and obviously Gannett's trying to sort of just modernize the company and, and be on the sort of front line of some new technologies. Um, do you feel like, how do you sort of decide what investments to make for Gannett and what you guys should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing? Gannett is now a network of 109 newsrooms across the country, with USA Today as our national brand riding at the center. We're proud that underneath that, we employ 3,800 journalists. I think we're one of the largest, if not the largest employer of your profession, sir, in the country. And that does a couple of things for us. Number one, we've seen the bifurcation of journalism to the coasts occur for very obvious reasons over the past five years. New York, Washington, San Francisco, Los Angeles primarily. And we very proudly employ journalists in Des Moines, in Indianapolis, across the Midwest, across the Southwest. And one thing that allows us to do is to test and measure new devices and storytelling. So last summer at the Iowa State Fair, our Des Moines Register brand partnered with the State Fair to build a soapbox on which 19 of the presidential candidates stood upon. One at that time did not stand on that soapbox, and that was Mr. Trump. And we joked maybe that's because we stacked 18 GoPro cameras and actually did a live feed in VR of these presidential speeches. We thought maybe people, he thought people might see the back of his head or something like that. Uh, it was very hot that day in Des Moines, and we actually had to go out and rent fans to keep yeah. the GoPro cameras from melting. Mm -hmm. And live streaming in 360 mm -hmm. is uh, kind of like flying without a net, and we learned a lot. We built code and developed uh, the ability to take what was at that time a desktop reader experience uh, so that we could build out the capability across the device spectrum. So Jeremy, we, we, we placed early bets on virtual reality and more on augmented and mixed because we felt specifically that VR provided a storyteller with tools that created an empathy to put a reader into a position or a situation to see life from the viewpoint of a different perspective or someone else's uh, shoes, un unlike any other storytelling device Right. known to journalism to that point. So, so when do you decide whether it's working, whether you want to spend more money on it? Because there's obviously a big cycle of, of as a trade journalist, a cycle of articles about how companies are trying out this and they're excited about this. And um, we don't often get enough metrics to know, is it working? We just sort of slowly see plans change. So how, at what point do you stop and say, maybe we shouldn't be doing so much in VR, maybe we should, we should be doing more in AR, or we should be doing podcasts, or we also have newspapers to produce, so you have other things to do always, but at what point do you stop and sort of see how everything's going? Uh, uh, by the way, on the podcast front, we currently, if you go into your iTunes, into the podcast section, the Cincinnati Inquirer, one of our great brands, has built a podcast called The Accused, which is the number one podcast in the iTunes store right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a little... Commercial. Right. There you go. On, on VR, we felt that not only did journalists love the tool because of the empathy I described earlier, mm -hmm. but in the macro, when we see Facebook and specifically Zuck, Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, Google, HTC, all placing big bets and often bets that were being made personally mm -hmm. by the CEO, we felt, hey, that's a great tailwind to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, this past November and December, we released a piece of VR content uh, that was shot inside a Blue Angels F-14 jet to give a reader an immersive experience of what it's like to fly in formation with Blue Angels pilots. 
And we got an email from Facebook and their newsroom innovation team saying that their CEO, comma, Mark, mm -hmm. loved the piece and could he post it to his Facebook page. Did you get, make any money off of that? <laughs> Well, we're building audience around this, Jeremy, and we are making money off of VR, which we can talk about. Right. Okay. Um, and there's just a lot. And, and um, you know, your company, we've talked about the scale you get from having all your newspapers, and you combine it, and you sort of, it's over 100 million uniques, you said, a month. Um, do you feel that you're as nimble as some of the smaller digital upstarts in that sense? I know I've asked you that question before, and I'm sure you're ready for it. But, I mean, how do you, how do you compete with sort of the young, um, I guess a lot of VC funded companies that are all about digital experimentation and don't have, you know, they don't have the revenue stream of a, of a print newspaper, but they also don't have, I guess, some of the baggage. And that is a great notion for contemplation, Jeremy, and one that we think about a lot. You know, as a media company with a heritage base, you see a lot of growth in readership, both uh, on desktop and in mobile, occurring with heritage-based media companies right now. We're very proud, to your point, we're at 120 million uniques, making us, the USA Today Network, the largest source for news and information in America online. And actually, number one is Yahoo and ABC. I'm not sure how they get to combine. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we chose a broadcast partner and combine, we'd probably be pretty big too. But right. um, so, so underneath that, we think a lot about <clears throat> the print heritage that got us where we are today the trust that's engendered in over 100 communities across America, but all the while knowing that our future is on a device and most specifically on the mobile web. Mm -hmm. And so much of the strategic planning, the testing and measuring, the hiring of talent, the developing of product is occurring specifically on the mobile web. Mm -hmm. It's where our scale is and we know that driving engagement, meaning getting our readers to spend more time with us on the mobile website uh, is everything for the future. Right. So we, we definitely have a, a large component of our company that is putting out a very profitable newspaper mm -hmm. across the country for us every day, but we also then commit uh, talent to uh, digital and specifically mobile future. Okay. And you've talked before about trying to find trends between readers in different parts of the country. So obviously a reader who reads a newspaper in Tennessee is different than one who reads a paper in Massachusetts, but they might have some of the same topic-based interests or things like that. And I guess that works for advertisers potentially if they want to reach people who align in certain ways. We were digging into the data on this podcast, The Accused, last night. This is a podcast that was built out of Cincinnati. It's a true crime type of podcast. And when we looked at the audience, 15% of the audience is coming from overseas mm -hmm. to a podcast built by the Cincinnati Inquirer. And so that, that harkens at the technology element that media companies are more and more embracing. You know, the, there's the argument, is Facebook a technology company or are they a media company? And I think more and more media companies are running at the technology that gives them the ability to create more depth and uh, more reach mm -hmm. with audiences. I mean, a reporter from Cincinnati likely would not have garnered an audience from Australia mm. five years ago. And now building out on a content management system, being able to distribute off our owned and operated sites uh, gives us that ability. So, I mean, do you think, how, how do you see Gannett in terms of media company, tech company? Um, where do you fall down on that? Is that still a worthy conversation to have? I, mean, I know it was a bigger conversation, it feels like, a few years ago, but now that you're seeing in places like you know, Verizon and all the blending of all these different tech and media companies, I guess it's just content and distribution now. Yes, so two ways to think about that. We believe that we can become a third choice to Facebook or Google in the advertising marketplace. We have humility around that. And we know we have a lot of work to do, but we believe that the environments we're creating across the country that are trusted, that help build brands, that do different things for an advertiser than the more down funnel DR and performance based advertising performance of Facebook or Google, that provides us with a differentiation that I don't think the Frankenstein of Yahoo and AOL provide, quite frankly. So we think about that a lot. And then at the same time, we partner with Facebook and Google more and more to distribute content off of our owned and operated sites and onto their platforms mm -hmm. um, very uh, 
linearly with Facebook Instant Articles mm -hmm. and with Google Accelerated Mobile Pages. Th that phenomenon of the speeding of the mobile web has definitely elevated at media companies as we think about developing mobile web products for the future. We know that speed drives a better user experience, it drives a longer user experience, and it drives a better advertising experience too. So you will see engineering principles start to seed into more and more of the workflow that occurs in media companies, very much including the one I work for. Let me ask you about VR quickly. Um, you know, I remember a panel where Eamon Store, CEO of Guardian US, talked about VR and how he, he said something sort of where he wasn't quite all in, that he was thought people were monetizing it too fast. They were rushing a little bit. And I read an article this week about how the Guardian's building a VR team. So they're doing it. But um, do you agree? I mean, how do you decide, or how do you sort of decide how long to let an audience build and, and hit a comfort spot before you start trying to come to brands and saying, we can do this really well, trust us over T-Brand Studios or another media company that does branded VR type stuff? Well, we also, Get Creative is the branded content studio at USA Today Network, which led by Kelly Andreessen, who I worked with at the Washington Post. And we, we started getting out ahead of helping brands use virtual reality to tell their stories. We actually created a piece in March of this year with Honda. Mm -hmm. Honda had built the fastest two-seater car yet developed, uh, an Indy car. And so we aligned branded content that we shot in the second seat of that Indy car to show people what it's like to go 200 miles an hour on a track to launch with the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500, which occurred in May. The Indianapolis Star is one of our great brands too. We just launched this week, uh, by the way, on Monday, a great VR partnership with Toyota and Camry. They wanted to show readers what it was like in virtual reality to be transported to places they always dreamed of but likely would not go. So Get Creative, working as a creative agency, went to Western Australia, Tallinn, Estonia, and is right now shooting in New England, um, showing people what it's like to experience these amazing places as a tourist. That's so to your point though, Jeremy, we, we know that 360 mm -hmm. on the desktop or on your mobile device, either touching it or scrolling with it, is the mm -hmm. gateway into a virtual experience. And so we've seen it go from desktop and mobile to cardboard, and we're seeing, including Google's Daydream launch this week, devices launching across the spectrum. If you go to Amazon right now, you will literally see hundreds of VR goggle hardware choices there. And that, we think, is going to continue to propel the market forward. But I mean, so people talk about branded content as being the answer to low quality display, and there's some stories this week about people trying to do more custom display ads, but branded content is very expensive to make, VR content probably even more so. So how do you do it in a way that's economical enough that it's not bankrupting the clients and the brands and still makes you guys some money, right. but is actually good stuff that people want to, want to look at and don't want to sort of use a blocker to get around if I guess they can't with branded, but how do you decide? Or, in, or in virtual reality, right. yet. In two weeks, on October 20th, we will be launching what we think is the first weekly VR show called Virtually There. And we'll be launching with a number of partners and along with uh, the ability for a partner to have custom built branded content in VR into the show, we've also invented a new ad product for VR called the Cube Commercial. Mm -hmm. And we are in the uh, build out stage right now with brands. So it becomes an ad unit that bolts into the show that is much more scalable to your point than having to go out and shoot custom VR content in Australia, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole year we've been on a drumbeat from CES to Cannes talking to brands about the fact that the IAB did not have standards for ad units in the virtual space. Let's invent that together. Let's be thought leaders. Let's push the industry forward here. And so that led to the Cube Marshall. Okay, well there's a lot more questions to ask about the media industry in the future, but I think that's all the time we have for now. So thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Jeremy. Always Good to see you. Thank you.